Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 223 for Friday, August 23rd, 2019. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that is by, for, and about working musicians here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire. Since we last spoke, I am Dave Hamilton. Out here in Los Gatos, California, Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Paul Kent? Pretty good. I uh, had a busy work week, and I only have one gig this weekend, but it's actually, I have a one to f- one to six at a car show. Then I got to drive an hour and do three hours of, of acoustic music with acoustic madness. So Saturday is going to be a long day that we'll see how it goes. That is a long day. So is that that same car show that I played with you several uh, years that, ago? That's right. It's the same one. Yeah. 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 That's fun. I mean, that's a fun afternoon, but, but that is a tiring afternoon. Three sets over five hours. Yeah. Now. Yeah. And you're outside and you know, that, that always, yeah. Yeah. Well, well I'm sure you will make it through it. I have no doubt, Thank my you. friend. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, I have a. I, this work week's been crazy. After traveling, you know, there's always crazy stuff, and you got to catch up and feel like you've, you know, caught up and all that. And then uh, I have a uh, Hedwig gig at midnight tonight, and then another one at midnight tomorrow. And I did that last week. In fact, you know, I was out in Orlando the last time we spoke, and I was. I woke up Friday. I think I mentioned. The, this craziness of my schedule. I woke up Friday morning at like whatever, five or five 30, went to the airport, caught a seven 30 flight, flew home, rehearsed Hedwig all afternoon, um, came home, slept for maybe 40 minutes, ate some food, went back to the theater and did the midnight show of, uh, of Hedwig on Friday. And it was, it was interesting. You know, the last time we did these shows, this is the first time we're doing them at midnight, which Seems strange to me to do anything other than Rocky Horror at midnight, uh, but and and it may be, well be strange. But I'm told that in in Europe, in in the UK specifically, they the Hedwig is at midnight is a thing, kind of like Rocky mm-hmm. Horror at midnight is a thing yeah. here. Yeah, and it you know it worked it way better than I thought it would at midnight. Um, I wasn't quite sure. You know, it's a it's a it, we, 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 this time we're doing it as a one act, which is smart, about an hour and 20 minutes, um, which uh, with, for a midnight start is the right thing. But, um, it, you know, there's a, it's a lot of monologuing by Hedwig. Like that's yeah. most of the show. So I wasn't sure how engaged people would stay when you're starting at midnight. They've probably been out, you know, partying and drinking all night and now they show up. And, and to be fair on Saturday night, there was one person right in the front row and the front row is basically on stage. It's a stadium type seating in this, in the Seacoast rep theater. And uh, so the, like the front row, their feet are sitting on, on the stage. And mm. this one woman like was out and I noticed it, you know, maybe, I don't know, two thirds of the way through the show. And I caught Ken, our guitar players attention. I'm like, Hey man, check it out. And th- we were in the middle of this song. That's just piano and vocals is very sort of delicate and stuff. But as soon as that song ends, we come in with this like heavy, like really heavy punk kind of thing that just like, you know, balls to the wall. And uh, and he's like, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll wake her up. We got this, you know. <laughs> and uh, about halfway through the song, we caught each other's eye. I was like, nope, we haven't woken her up. Still out, whoa. So, dude, she was out until her friends had to wake her up at the end of the show. Clearly had you know had had probably had too much to drink or whatever and and was just totally passed out i mean it was there we were like rock and she was i mean maybe maybe 20 feet from my drums but probably not and you know i mean everything's amplified it's really loud and (laughs) nothing didn't even flinch like as soon as we started the tune i was looking to see what the reaction was because i you know this might have been one of those priceless moments it it was but not in the way i expected (laughs) So, That's funny. Yeah, it was interesting. We, oh, go ahead. Well, we had kind of a uh, an interesting moment in a in a winery show last Thursday. Um, so the setup is really nice. It's, it's a huge lawn, and then a um, it's like a cement patio that we pay, play on. So it's not a raised stage, 
but there's kind of the cement area and then there's the lawn and people bring their lawn chairs and they leave, you know, whatever human nature happens that people instinctively leave that force field of a, of a dance floor in front of them when coming out to something like this, there was you know plenty of room for dancing. However, we had a woman who decided, Oh, I didn't, what it was, was I think she had heels on and she couldn't dance on the grass. Why she wouldn't take her shoes off. I don't know. But anyway, but she was basically on the cement right in front of us. So we don't push to the very edge of the cement. I um, mean, we leave a little space, um, but she was on stage and she, it was one of those things where it was clear that she wanted the attention on her. Right. 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 She, she wasn't shy about it. Now she wasn't doing anything wrong. And technically, you know, she could be wherever she wanted to be. She wasn't on, she wasn't technically on stage, but she was just kind of, you know, shimmying back and forth across the stage and, whether she was flirting with the band or whether she was flirting with the audience, I don't know, but a lot of people were kind of pointing, kind of snickering and, you know, it, the attention went there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I didn't say to her, are you sure you want to dance up here? You know, you, plenty of people are out there in the, on the grass area. I should have said something didn't dawn on me what the right thing to do is. So she did it for about a half a set and then she was gone. But that, you know, that half a set, that's what it was. It was like, you know, why is that woman trying to be different from everybody else and having to be up there when we're all over here and, and uh, you know, she's dancing a little bit suggestively and, you know, it was that type of thing. Yeah. So. I've, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've experienced that too. I've never quite understood what drives people to choose to do that. I mean, it often is alcohol, right. You know, or something like that, but, but even still like most people don't do that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting it was a look thing. At me, a look at me thing. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But it, but it's all, it's a look at me while I break this, you know, invisible line yes. that we all know exists. It's not look at me. It's, I, I am, I, look at me is the priority and it doesn't matter whose space I invade to do that. Right. Like it's, yeah. it's two things together. And that, that always, I mean, and it's, you're right. It will, it makes it awkward for everyone. So I guess, I, I mean, in those moments, I've always tried to like ignore it because if you feed into it, then you're feeding into the look at me, right? No matter if you acknowledge it positively or negatively, you're still like feeding into some level of the look at me, right? You know, yeah. in, in their mind, even if you say, oh, why don't you get out of here? It's like, oh, look at me. I made them say, right? Like it's, it, it feeds that same desire and potentially perpetuates it. Whereas ignoring it, you hope that it just goes away. Um, in your case, probably you hope that it had gone away sooner. Yeah, um, a little sooner. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what would have been the right thing to say? You know, hey, somebody asked this nice lady to dance so she can dance with you. Or, you know, oh, or, or that's brilliant. You know, Dude, you know, something. <laughs> somebody asked this nice lady to dance so it doesn't have to be one of us. You don't you don't say the last part, but but that's you know, that's the implication, right? Like we're yeah. kind of busy up here. Maybe and that's the other way to do it. If if the if you notice like you did that the crowd is snickering at her, like say, Hey, you know, we're kind of busy up here. Maybe you want to do this out there, you know, like like an invitation to leave. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I like that though. Somebody want to help this? Somebody want to dance in, with this nice lady? The answer in is many, no. Many, many ways. Yeah, the answer <laughs> might be no. In many, many ways. Engaging the audience when there's something awkward happening is probably a good idea, right? Yeah, because they already Provide, know. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Provides you a little cover. It demonstrates that you know and you're in control of the situation. I mean, there's there's a lot of you know everybody That's can kind of like yeah find a way where it's not hurtful or not mean, not mean spirited, not embarrassing anybody. You know, just kind of like, you know, you know, somebody, somebody asked this lady to dance and, you know, so you guys can look at us cause we're much uglier, you know, something self-effacing might help her. Oh, that's true. You know? Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's taken, she, right. She's much prettier than us. And so we, we, but we want to be seen too. So yeah, yeah, that's right. You could, yep. Yep. You could, if you can sell that, you know, I was thinking about that. We've had this conversation on the show in many different ways about engaging with the crowd and you have to do something that is natural to your personality, right? Like that it always boils down to that, that if you do something that would work, like if I did something that would work for you or you did something that would work for me, that may or may not work for the other one, right? Like it's, you have to, you have to be able to sell it as a, as your thing. So yeah, that's, that's, it's tough though. 
Yeah. In that situation, I think you're right though. You have to bite the bullet and uh, find a way to acknowledge it. But unless it's, unless there's something dangerous or truly like terribly distracting, like they're grabbing instruments or something, you probably have, you have a minute or two to think about, you know, okay, what am I going to say? It's nice to kind of have some standbys and we've just offered a couple here that I'm definitely going to, you know, store in my little arsenal here. But, um, you know, think about, okay, is this the right thing to say? How's that going to play out? Think about, you know, two chess moves down the road. Is this hopefully, you know, can I see where this is going to go? Yep. Okay. That's the right thing to say. Like you don't have to just say the first thing that comes to mind in, in those sort of pressure scenarios, you got a little bit of time because they're making it more awkward as it goes on. So (laughs) kind of fuels your, your thing. I mean, if somebody's on stage for, for 10 seconds and you are immediately like berating them, you have less of the audience on your, you, you risk alienating the audience along with alienating that person. Right. As opposed to if they're up there for a little while, like you said, you noticed they're pointing fingers, that sort of thing. It's like, ah, right. Okay. I can, I can use this. I can gingerly sort of address this. Yep. That's interesting. Hey, I was thinking about something. Well, uh, hang on, because because you we 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 derailed from from where we were before um, with regard to this this Hedwig show that I did on Friday. Uh, yeah. I um I was uh, I was uh, where were we? Oh, right. So the last time we did Hedwig, I think I mentioned it was you know an, like an eight or nine p.m. start, and it was a sold out run, and so we all were a little concerned about what's this going to be like if we don't have the, the, you know, the sold out run, like what's the feel of that theater going to be. And I didn't look at ticket sales on Friday. I was like, I just need to focus on going out and doing the best show that I can, which is like, in my opinion, the only thing to do, right. No matter how many people are in the house, you go and deliver. But of course I was curious. And, uh, and Brandon, our director, was really smart as we got into places we're all sort of right in the wings of the stage and he said to us he's like all right so here's the deal there's about 50 really eager people out there that are super excited to see you play (laughs) and it was like okay so this theater holds about 200 right you know when it's when it's packed ear to ear right but um it was like okay and it turns out he was right like this crowd was small but mighty, if I'm going to borrow a, a, a phrase from the show, but it was true. Like they were just as energetic as any crowd that we've played this show for, regardless of size. They mm-hmm. were super into it, which was great. I mean, the whole gig worked out great. Um, but it was interesting. You know, he he knew that he needed to prep us because he knew that when we walked out there, he didn't want us to, to even flinch about seeing an empty seat, you know, and um and I said to him, like, oh, that's good. I said, you know, the last time we did this, it was like, it was full and this, the crowd roared, right? I said, it's a nice sales pitch that you're doing here, Brandon. But, but, you know, okay, thank you. And he's like, yeah, yeah, but, you know, I had to warn you guys. I'm like, no, no, it's fine. And, and like I said, he was right. We, um, we went out and, and delivered and it was, you know, the crowd had, it was one of those scenarios where I always say you have that exchange of energy between the, you know, the band or the the performers in this case. It's, I mean, I guess we are just a band uh, and the crowd. And uh, I always say it has to start with the band, right? You, you have to assume that it's going to start with the band. Um, and, and then hopefully, you know, the crowd will give it back to you. In this case, believe it or not, it actually started with the crowd. Like by the time I got to my drums, I was amped up because of how amped up the crowd was. That's great. And it was like, right, this, okay, good. And that's how it was the last few times we did this. But I walked out there expecting for it not to be that. And so it, I perhaps even felt like double that. And I did notice, you know, by the time we got to the end of the first tune, it was like, okay, we're all really excited. Um, We're all playing a little, hitting a little harder, you know, than I normally would. We're all playing a little louder. We're all dug in a little bit. It's like, okay, this is good. This is a good way to start, especially at midnight. Keep everybody awake. But we need to, you know, we have to go somewhere from here. So we've got to, you know, ease through this a little bit. And everybody that's involved in this is a total pro. I mean, like, it, you know, it, it's fantastic. It, our, on Saturday night, I felt so bad. Our bass player had some gastrointestinal thing going on, and he had been throwing up all day. And it was like, oh, dude. And 
I knew this. I had no idea how bad it was for him until we got off stage and I had a couple things to do like on stage. I took like off my wig and costume and stuff. And, and then I walked back to sort of where he and, and some of the rest of the people were. And somebody else said, Oh, you know, Brian's in the bathroom throwing up. And it's like, Oh my God. Like I've been off, we've been off stage for 15 minutes and this poor dude still like he bolted from the stage right back in. It's like, what a pro man. He made it through an hour and a half of this thing and, Amazing. and rocked it. Like he was great. It wasn't like he was, you know, hiding by his amp, just waiting for it to end or anything. He, you had, I knew that he was sick and I had forgotten that he was sick because of how well he was playing and how well he was just, you know, driving and, and being a part of the show. God, it was that, that, that is Got the to. level. Yeah, hat tip, big time hat tip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know what the crowd's going to be like tonight, but I'm I'm prepared to go on stage and be the one that to bring the energy, and we'll see. Um, we'll see how it goes. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there, there's the lesson: go on stage, assuming every single time that you yeah. have to bring it. Like that's the because you don't know. You and you know, and it's nice when you can be surprised when you don't when when it when somebody else has more than you, but but don't expect that. Um, yeah, we get the, uh, most gigs, most gigs are a, you know, you got to kind of get the audience going, right? Yeah. So you're yes. starting and right. however, when we do the gigs where we're the, like the last band of the day, you know, and people have come specifically to see us and some other band has gotten people warmed up. And then there's just the, uh, you know, that little bit of anticipation is worth setting up. That's one time where the energy is probably matched. Like we feel that there's a buzz of people are excited to see us specifically. Yep. And, and, you know, within the first eight bars, you know, we're, we're finding our place right along with them. So that, that's a great feeling. You don't get it as often as you would hope to get it, you know, right, right. but, but when you get it, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yep. It's, um, it's part of what, you know, keeps me going and for sure out there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's, let's play a game. Okay. So you're Dave Hamilton Esquire. You own a mansion and a yacht and you uh, played drums years ago. Can I wait? Can I have a helicopter too? Uh, uh, Yeah, you can have a helicopter. Okay. Just checking. Great. That in addition or instead of one of the other two. Well, I want yacht and helicopter money is really Uh, what I'm going after here. Not yacht or helicopter money because I think there's two different things. Right. Dave Hamilton, Esquire, you own a mansion, a yacht, and a helicopter. And now it's time for you to go back and indulge the creative side of your life. You've built a business. You've worked. You actually could be Dave Hamilton, coal miner, or bricklayer, or electrician. The point is really the same. It's now time for you. In today's world, the electrician might actually make more money than Dave Hamilton, Esquire. (laughs) So I'm just saying. So there you go. (laughs) But you want to start, you want to get back into music and you want to, you want to play band now. Now, maybe you've listened to this show, you know, as, as kind of what your appetite for it, but you're going to start from square one. And so the game is, what do you do first? What would you do first? Interesting. Well, so I've always, I, th- th- this is a little bit unfair because I've actually thought about this. Like if I had unlimited money, what would I do? And I would definitely start an original band. Um, because I can market it, right. I can go and put this thing on the road for, uh, you know, six months and we can all live in the nicest hotel rooms and travel (laughs) on the nicest, you know, helicopters and, and planes. And like, you could do a full, like full scale, full budget tour, even though you're only playing in, you know, like, like the nine thirty club and things like that. Right. So, um, because I think if you, if you have if you work with good songwriters and you have good songs and are able to perform them well and are able to get out there and perform them regularly for crowds that, you know, haven't seen you before and get those opening slots and all of that. I I think that's actually, it's a pretty short road and by, by short, I mean several years, but, but if you're doing it with effectively unlimited budget, I think you can make that work. And then you've developed your own identity and your own crowd that no one can take from you, right? You can give it away by stopping doing all of those things, but no one's going to take it from you. 
Mm. So, all right, but let, that's, let but that's a little, little different than what yeah. you meant to ask. And I get that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the emphasis isn't really on the money and right. I, it's more like if you were getting whatever, wherever you're coming from, yeah. whatever stage yeah, yeah. of life you're coming from and you want to play covers, you want to have some fun. Yep. Maybe make some money. Um, you know, but you literally, you don't have a network of, of sure. musicians, you, you know, you literally, you're starting from scratch. You just know you want to do it. Yep. Where would you start? Um, I would, this is really interesting. Uh, you know, it's easy for me to default to what I've always done, which is I will go find people that I want, that want to play, that need someone to play with and I will play with them. Right. Uh, because How that's, you find a, them? uh, Craigslist or, you, you know, go visit, go watch, go start seeing local bands, find the clubs that you think you could play in the early stages of things and go meet those bands and get to know the musicians and ingratiate myself into the scene somehow. Right. All right. Now knowing what you know. Yep. So now you're doing that and you're going to reach out to Craigslist, but do you know, knowing what you know, you've listened to gig gab for the past several years. Yep. Do you know what criteria you would put around the people? Would you look for them to have similar musical interests as you? Would you just look for the best players that you could find? Would you say, well, I'm a, I'm a B player, so I better look for other B players. Or would you be like, I'm going to try and you know, see if I can hang with the A players. What, what approach would you take to creating that pool of people that you think you might like to play with? Yeah. So the first thing I would do is play on, on my own in my rehearsal room, like just in the woodshed. Every day I have found for me that if I am playing, I will find opportunities to play. And if I'm not playing, I won't find opportunities to play. And I think that part of that is just intention, right? If, if it's top of mind, if it's something I'm doing all the time, it, you know, then I'll, I'll think more about it. Not just the, during the times that I'm actively hunting, but you know, during the passive time too, but it also keeps your chops up. Right. So that when the opportunity comes, you can actually deliver. I would always look to play with people that are better than me um, because that's how you learn. And as long as you're, you know, if I'm a B player, I'm going to look for A players. If I'm a D player, like a C player, I'd probably still look for the A players. A D player, I, you know, you try to look for the A players, but they're probably going to suss you out pretty quick and, and say, yeah, this, this just isn't a good fit. You, you know? Okay. Let's pause right there because okay. you just said something so interesting. So, to my experience, the A players in my league, it's it's a little clicky. You know, they kind of sure. reform bands with each other in different formations over time. And, sure. and breaking into that is not an easy thing. So at least where I am, a B player or a C player, you know, maybe you could do that if you're the guy who's going to get gigs and just get them work. Right. But just on a on a, a chops hang basis, what you've described, at least where I live would seem a little bit harder. Oh, it's definitely going to be harder, but, but there's no reason not to try. Like if there's it, when I say I'm going to go out to play it's a Craigslist, I'm looking for people that are look that are, that are like, I'm not necessarily posting. I'm responding to posts. So if I see a band and you're right, a lot of times the, you know, the a list players will not post on Craigslist because they just have their network already. And it's like, Oh, right. I need a drummer. I know, I know Ronnie and, and like that, I want that guy, you know, and that's it. Yep. Right. So you got to get into that scene. And uh, so I would take any opportunity I could, as long as it's something that I could see myself doing. And, and this is it, musically, uh, you know, I've learned over the years that it doesn't matter what I like to listen to. I like to play almost anything. Um, and, and there are some things I've found that I don't like to play, uh, but not necessarily styles of music, more uh, s gig type scenarios. Like for right. example, right? Like the, the theater thing. I mean, I'm having a blast with Hedwig. That's awesome. Those theater shows where, uh, you know, the, the pit is, you know, underneath the, the theater and can't see anything and is watching the band on a video screen. It's fun. You know, if you like solving math problems on your drums in a closet and, and like that, I, I say that dismissively, but I, I mean it like, like that can actually be fun, but it is not fun all the time for me. Right. So, you know, would I take a six week gig doing that where I'm playing five gigs a weekend? No, I wouldn't, but you know, music stylistically, I'll play anything. Uh, and, but, I, but if I'm having my druthers, I would, 
prioritize something where I might have to play a little like, like, you know, something that's going to yep. require some chops or, or yep, some, yep. some finesse. Right. All right. So, but, but I, you know, a straight ahead rock gig, even a country gig. I thought I, I, I thought I hated country music until I played in a country band. Somebody called me and said, you're the guy I want. I'm doing this, you know, string of country gigs. I want you to play. I'm like, dude, I don't like, that's not my bag. He's like, yeah, it is. Trust me. You'll be fine. And sure enough, man, it's like, oh, this is much harder than it looks, yeah. but, but it doesn't require that, you know, uh, the, the finesse and, and, and dexterity maybe that, that I want to, I want to, you know, play with a little bit. So, yeah. So you're, you're more style agnostic than most people that I know, right? Most people I know, you know, they want to be in a rock band. They want to mm. be in a funk band. They want to be in a corporate band. They want, you know, there's that you know, style, you know, kind of defines themselves, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah. All I right. mean, wait, like when I found Uptown, I most definitely was like, oh, you know, I'm missing. And part of it is, you know, talking to you every week, it reminded me how much I'm, I missed playing in, um, in ghetto fabulous, right. The, their groove syndicate, whatever the name of that band has become since right. then, you know, I, I missed that. Oh, like, right. That party vibe that can be fun. And, and so I kept my eyes out for that. And then just magically that opportunity opened up. It's like, well, that's interesting. You know, <laughs> huh? All right. and, you know, so I, like I have done that t at times where it's like, I, I want a specific thing, but, uh, but mostly it's like, no, I want to, I want to play with people that I can, like get along with and that can get along with me and uh and you know and and like the style what the the types of songs we're playing honestly it, if i'm playing covers i i it doesn't really matter as long as the scenario that i am playing in is such that the crowd that shows up is it's hearing what they're expecting to hear and they're happy right because this is all about entertainment at that point Right. Mm. It's like if I can get on stage and play songs and have, you know, fun and I, fun is easy to have. Like if you can lock in with good players, it doesn't really matter to me what song I'm playing. As long as we're having fun playing it and the people out there are having fun hearing it, I'm good. Um, All right. Well, let's talk about that for a second yeah. because we had this great conversation last week about A list songs and sure. breaking into the list. Yeah. Uh, so you, you decide, you know, you, you woodshedded, you know, you've gone through your process of finding people that you want to play with. Sure. You pull a couple of people together. You're in, in this scenario, you're the leader of the band. Okay, Dave. Okay. You, you know, you're, you're harnessing the people. You're going to go out and get the gigs. What strategy would you take starting from scratch on songs? And the reason I ask this is we talked about a list songs and we've talked in the past about vanity songs. You know, I, I, I'm keenly aware, I'm going to generalize a bit, but in my scene, there's a predominance of classic rock cover bands, right? With a fair amount of crossover of their song lists, fair amount. There are some purpose-built corporate bands, and they each take a little bit of a different angle to being different, because we've talked about, you know, what, what, what's going to make you different. There's some bands that are, you know, they're certainly a couple country bands, good country bands. There's some, you know, funk, you know, bands play really soul and funk music exclusively. And our thing is more like a, a, a hybrid of everything, right? So, you know, we have a good mix of rock and soul and, uh, you know, that's our thing. Are we overthinking this thing with regards to songs or, you know, t tell me what you would do to make sure that you're going to launch a new cover band. That's not going to be tired, that you're not just redoing what other people are doing. Like I said, last week, yep. you haven't seen my fastball. Actually, we have seen your fastball. Yeah, we have. That's right. So I am <laughs> going to, I, I'm going to absolutely engage with the premise, but first I'm going to reject the premise and it only because you are, you're, and I'm, I'm fine playing the game, but you're asking me to be you, right? Because I am, I am, I would almost, I cannot, I am. No, which is fine, right? And I, I'll play that game. But just for the record, like I've never managed anything other than an original band. I've never really like that. I'm fine playing in cover bands as long as somebody else is doing that work. But I, I don't know that I could get myself to the point where I was doing what you do for a cover band. And I don't say that judgmentally. Like there needs yeah. to be people like you and me. It, it, we need each other, right? Like that's that's a really good thing. Uh, but I don't, yeah, yeah, I like, I, I don't know that I could 
truly do that. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'll wrap my head around this. So what would I do if I had to pick the song list? I mean, I would do almost exactly what, what Gary has done in Uptown. It would be like, okay, let's acknowledge this for what it is. We are going out and we are picking low-hanging fruit. We want to be popular. We want to be well-paid. We want to have fun at the gigs and being well-paid means that we can afford to have, you know, a sound person. We can afford to have all the right gear. Maybe we can even afford to have some roadies, right? Like, the, you know, those types of things. Um, and so to do that, we're going to, we're going to have uniforms or some sort of dress. I don't want to say uniforms, but you know, the band is going to look a certain way. It's going to cop a certain vibe. We're going to play all of the low hanging fruit that everybody wants to hear. And we're going to market ourselves the, the where we are going to win this battle is in marketing because to your point, everybody's playing all those same songs. My fastball comes with, I am better at getting in touch with the people that are going to pay me well than you are. Like that's the fastball has been thrown and caught long before I ever put my drums in my car and head to a gig. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, that's like, you know, that's the, uh, I don't, I don't know of any of a, 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 you know, a magic solution there. So, Yeah. Well, what I think you're just saying is you defined your purpose. We are going to be a corporate band and being a corporate band. We're a function band, right? Like you can play weddings, you can play yeah. corporate gigs, but yeah, we're, I wouldn't. We, I wouldn't. We are for money, not for creative satisfaction, not for, you know, not yeah. for personal satisfaction. So because yeah. I can do personal satisfaction with cover songs in my studio. And I'd like that. I, I have a, I have a lot of fun playing cover songs. Don't get me wrong. Right. It's right, just right, right. the bar scene with cover songs is like, <sighs> it's exactly what you're saying. Like, what's the, I don't know. Like if I'm starting from scratch, I want to have, I want, I want every dance floor to be full and packed with happy people. And the best way to do that is that somebody else has a lot of happy people that want to see a band and you just hired me. Yeah. <laughs> like that's it. So it's a much simpler path to it. Yep. Sure. You know, the thing is, is when, when is the cover John retired? Like when is it, it's been done, you know? Yep. And, and I think it's been done when everybody says, you haven't seen me play Sweet Child of Mine. <laughs> and it's like, it's okay. I saw the other guy play Sweet Child of Mine. It was just fine. I saw Slash so, do it. He did, he did a great job. <laughs> he did a really good job. Yeah, on it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, the, and I, I think that that's the effort. Still, it seems like so much of where the cover genre is coming from is people rediscovering their love of music and wanting to get back into it. And the love of music they have is you know, sixties and seventies rock, you know, or maybe eighties rock. And that's, you know, large part, you know, and then you start playing and, you know, you have all your, you know, genius uh, vanity songs, but then you play one popular one and everybody reacts and you're like, Oh, I get it. And then you start gravitating towards more. And then that's what ones. happens. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, like the, the uh, first original band that I played in, uh, it was called RITA. Um, and, uh, it was a high school band. And we did really well when we started out, we played, you know, maybe one cover per set. Right. I mean, it was, we did them weird and it was, we were an original band, right. Which was great. And we had a good following of our friends from high school. Mostly it was other people's friends because they were much better at the social game than I was, which is fine. <laughs> it's, just like, it's just how it worked, right. It was all of your friends, but that's cool. They're into this. So I'm into it. Like it was great. And it, good songwriters, you know, fun songs to play. People would sing them back to us, and that's really cool. And then we started playing more covers because we liked them, right? And our singer was really into REM. This is when I got into REM. So we were playing a lot of REM covers. Like, they started we, – we were playing – I think if I look back to every cover that he – brought into the band it was either an rem song or a song that rem had covered in some way um shape or form he was a big rem fan and, you know and in, in high school you know you wear your influences quite literally on your sleeve right and and that's fine like that that was great and, th and then we had some police tunes because another guy in the band really liked the police and that also fit with that sort of you know new wave sort of vibe -y thing that we had going on we played some pixie songs and i still hate the pixies but i liked playing their songs <laughs> um, I think I, I don't know that I actually hate the Pixies. I just say that. Um, but, uh, but you know, so we were, we were having fun, but, but the last gig we played was a hundred percent covers. Like we got off stage and it was like, 
we didn't play a single original. What mm. has happened here? Yeah. Yeah. And it was the death of that band, interestingly enough, Be, probably for all the reasons that you just said, right? Like, sure. y- you know, we had no differentiating factor anymore and we did it to ourselves. Like, So I'm going to offer this. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, in the interest of saying what rejuvenates uh, a cover band scene, right? Yeah. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. I like what really gets me going is when I see an artist cover something like yep. a big, a big time artist yes, and they put all the force and fury and style and uniqueness of them into some great song. The song is still great. And this is, so this is 180 degrees from you got to play it note from note to yeah. the original. Right. No. And which is like what we were doing in RHA it, exactly. initially, initially. And I would say after all this time, what I search for and what really gets me excited in terms of looking for cover material for us to do is either live representations where the original artist puts some kind of a cool twist on it. Yep. Or yep. when someone takes a song and all the essences of what makes it greater there for you to love, but they add their own, you know, who's off awesome at this is Bonamassa. He plays a ton of covers. Of course. I mean, I don't think in any, you know, he's a blues guy. So he's playing a lot of blues standards covers, but he just did, what was it? Um, oh, do you remember the Clapton song, Mainline Florida? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was great, the- great riff, like a real Clapton riff, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, and this was, uh, I think it was on um, Ocean 451, one of, one of his early albums, right? But Bonamassa did it and he made it big and he made it, you know, driving and Bonamassa style. And it sounded brand new to me. And But the original riff was like, oh, yeah, that song. And it just really made a light bulb go on for me. I, I'll find a link for it. We can share it. I just thought it was really great. And um, that, to me, is a way to take these 20, 30, 40, 50-year-old songs and, you know, re- make them rejuvenated for people. Yep. Uh, so and that's a that's a long way from where I started when I when I started my cover band was like, if you can't do it better than the original, you shouldn't do it. You know, you, you sure. should be true to the original, yeah. respect the original, you well, know, all and, sorts of philosophical and silliness. For the corporate band scenario that I just discussed, like you actually kind of need to be pretty close to the original. It doesn't need to be note for note, but yeah. it needs to people need to think they're hearing what is note. Don't for overthink note. it. Don't yeah. overthink it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can do some fun stuff, but make it fun. Don't make it clever. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would advocate now if I was starting something, you know, I would, you know, play some stuff, you know, that you can just grip it and rip it. But the stuff that I think would make make it fun, make it different, make it stand out, is actually if you can find some way to find these interesting takes on uh, on again these thirty, forty, fifty year old songs that you've heard and you've heard covers play. So yep. what are you adding to the equation? Well, so that's the that's the thing because as we're having this conversation. You, you know, we're talking about it from a musical standpoint, although, you know, as I sort of worked through it with the, the function band standpoint, it really wasn't about the music as, you know, that sort of table stakes. It's just about how you market and who you, you know, sell to sure. and all of that. But another way to look at it, especially if you don't just want to be that faceless corporate band that everyone loves for two and a half hours and then forgets, you know, like people will say, oh, yeah, I went to that party or I went to that wedding. That band was great. But no, like that's generally not a good place to market yourself for like club dates that that you have coming up. Right. Like that's just not how that world is. If you want to engender that kind of loyalty that is frankly far easier with an original band because chances are you're the only band that they can go see to hear those songs is to do something beyond the music and, you know, four wall, your own event, kind of like we did with fling and, and I, but, but I think there's more to it. Like I, I think we stopped short of where we could have gone with it. And actually we've been talking about maybe, you know, doing more of that, but throwing, you know, more of a party, kind of like we did with Cirque du Mac, right? Where, yes, we the band played, and yes, let's be perfectly honest, we gave people free drinks all night. So, <laughs> like, you know, this solves was, a lot of problems. This solves a lot of problems. <laughs> but that wasn't the only thing we did. You know, we had henna artists, we had jugglers, we had face painters, we had silks dancers, we had, uh, you know, like a photo booth, we had a caricaturist, we had, you know, it was, I mean, the, the term Cirque de Mac came from after we did our first party 
not before, right? It was like we called it, I think party 1.0 was the was right. the name of the first one. And then and we had this, you know, henna artist that was doing face painting and stuff there. And I was like, wait a minute, there's more to this. Um and uh and so it, you know, it evolved from that, but it became far more than just the band, right? It was an event and there were other things happening there, but it you know, we made sure it centered around the band. And it was a true party, not just a, a gig. And, and I think that, you know, I think about, I like to obviously like to go to see uh, a lot of concerts, but I, I wind, up, wind up going to a lot of fish shows. The music is a huge part of it, but it's not the only part of it. Right. I like that vibe. I like seeing like the, the circus that goes on at these shows, I'll, right. you know, walking around shakedown street, which is what, what that scene is that that scene's name for like all the vendors and stuff and going to see like all this crazy art that these people create or whatever. And they're selling, you know, sometimes I buy stuff, but generally no, cause it, like I, I don't necessarily need to fill my house with that stuff, but it's cool to see, you know, it's just fun to be in that experience of like, Oh, look at this whole, there's like this, this whole experience starts in the morning and the show doesn't happen until eight o'clock at night. You know, there's right. Right. So I think you, you need to, th and, and, to be very clear, Fish knew that and created that, so or created the opportunity for that to thrive and seeded it in many ways, so that they could have this because they knew that it's it can't just be about the music. It creates needs the community and create let, the let it, yeah, let it happen, let yeah, it happen, and then dead, let it happen. You know, and, and any great right. fan base does that, right? You know, tailgating. Yeah. You know, you make it an event, and you know uh, that means something to people. I will agree with you, and I'll I'll close with this. You know, the the House Rockers big event, the Los Gatos Park Dance, is coming up August thirty first. We're going to actually take next week off. Um, and we'll be back with our next episode the week after. So we're going to record the week of Labor Day, probably not on Labor Day, but probably on the Tuesday. Like that, we'll, it, we'll do it on the third. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. But um, yes. So the the one that we created seven years ago, that's grown to about, you know, somewhere between four and six thousand people. Um, and it's become a thing. And it's a thing that that serves us well in so many ways. Um you know, it's created community. It's created something people look forward to. It's created something that people have to take pictures of themselves at and tell people yeah. it creates a bunch of media for us. It creates, you know, a whole bunch of value. Um, so and, from and that none of thing, that is about the music. I, I don't mean to, to belittle the music of an event like that. Like that's, that is the, an, ev an event is bigger than the music, unless correct. it's the Rolling Stones, an event is bigger than but the But even the music. Stones, right? Like, I mean, you there, what are you doing before the band starts? You're talking to people around you. Oh, the last time I saw the Stones, like there's a community of people yeah. that like, there's an interaction that's happening. And, and I think that's lost on most people running bands, original bands and cover bands. I like, and I, you know, the bands that succeed either have that happen accidentally, you know, quite fortuitously, or they engage it. And part of that can be, you know, um, with like the fish has this whole, like there's this whole story that is told loosely in many, but not all of their songs, right? Actually a selection of their songs. Most don't have anything to do with this game hinge story, but there's this whole like thing in this culture that they created and like there's people that wanted to learn more about that story. And now they're engaged in, in a way that's happening when they're not at the show. Right. And they created a secret language with the crowd where they play certain riffs and the crowd responds in certain ways. Like that sort of thing is, I mean, yes, that's a musical cue, but that's way beyond, Hey, we're going to play, you know, 14 of our songs right now. Like there's, there's more to it than that. And, and you need to give people an experience, not just. So the last thing that you'll yeah. tell Dave Hamilton Esquire, who owns a mansion and a yacht and a helicopter is when you build your band, you got to try and make it a purpose. And you got to be keenly aware about that. You, you will have success if you can get a fan base that is built into not only you, but into each other, into each other. And that's more yeah. important. That's more important than, you know, it's funny. We were talking about this at podcast movement about the show. Right. And they're like, you got to give your fans a place to be your fans and don't over engage with them. Like, you know, you want to be there and be present and, and facilitate. We got to let it organically just be, but it's just got to be. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, you know, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. That's where you can go and talk to other <laughs> listeners to the show. This is a thing. So there you share go. your ideas, share your questions. Yeah. So, 
All right. Well, thanks for playing my game, Dave. It was an interesting, you know, I, I forget that you don't look at it the way that I do. And I was trying to put you in that box. You're a good sport. And thanks for doing it with me. Of course. No. And it's, it, it actually, I mean, like with anything in life, it's good to, you know, intentionally take yourself out of your own box. Even if you know, you're not going to really live over there. Like it's good to look back a little bit and be like, Oh, maybe I want a drummer that doesn't have so many opinions sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right I don't on. know. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, before we go, I do want to note that we are testing a new piece of hardware and have been for this entire episode. Uh, it is the Rodecaster Pro, which is sort of an, I've, I don't know how much I've talked about my crazy sort of Frankenstein podcast studio that I have here with outboard compressors and noise gates and all of this stuff. But the goal is to be able to mix externally with real faders so that, you know, if Paul's not loud enough, I can just le reach over to a physical thing and goose him and fade the music in the way I want to and all of that while also having connections back and forth between the computer and the, uh, you know, and the mixer, because of course Paul and I aren't in the same room. So I can't plug Paul's mic into my mixer. Paul's mic is plugged into his computer. We use VoIP software. We happen to use discord now, but it doesn't really matter what we use. And, uh, and I need to have that come into a separate channel on the mixer and I need the music on a separate channel or whatever. I Frankenstein this thing 14 years ago when we started uh, Mac geek gab and has, it has evolved road the microphone company um has built this thing called the roadcaster pro which does all of this in one little box and it can connect to the computer but it can also work you know totally separately so i'm this is literally the first show that i've recorded with it i experimented a little bit uh yesterday to uh to learn this thing and i'm getting there but i'm curious if you folks hear anything different about the sound positive negative please do let us know obviously we'll be listening back as well so just wanted to uh to mention that. So, yeah. We got anything else, my friend? Nope. That's it, Dave. Rock on. Rocking on. That's how we do it. Let's see if, uh, let's see if I can find where the band is and, uh, and make <laughs> them make noise. I did it. There it is. Hey. Right there. <laughs> such a nerd. I am such a nerd. I know. <laughs> it's okay, though. You know. Always be performing, Dave. Thanks, Paul. You too. Have uh, have a good gig. Have fun at your uh, at your festival, man. At your Thank party you, man. thing, I'll event. Back. Yes. <laughs>